Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode in Chagisk's Research Insights series. This series focuses on addressing the challenges and opportunities in the Irish agri-food sector and in showcasing the latest in Chagisk research. Today's webinar is brought to you from the Chagisk Food Research Programme, which is based at food research centres in Ashtown in Dublin and Moor Park in Cork. Today's webinar will focus on food bioactives, uh, the gut barrier and the relationship between diet, exercise and the microbiome. It will feature presentations from Dr. Linda Giblin, Dr. Maria Hayes and Dr. Orla O'Sullivan. Following the three presentations, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box on your screen and include the name of the person that you wish the question to be addressed to. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Linda Giblin is a senior research officer at Chagas Moor Park. Her research interests are food bioactives and the gut barrier. She is a leader in the International Network on Food Digestion and a leader in the EU cost action that focuses on food for the older adult. She is an editor of the Journal of Functional Foods and a funded investigator in the SFI Research Centre, Vistamilk. Over to you, Linda. So thank you very much, Maureen. So what I'm going to do now is try and share my screen. So Maureen, if you can let me know if you can see it there. Perfect, thanks Linda. Okay, so um, good morning everybody. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about my research. And I'm gonna give you a few examples and then why is it important to you? So um, the first thing is think of a soccer pitch. And the rules of soccer are that the soccer ball moves from your half of the pitch across the halfway line to the other half where you score a goal. So if you think about your half of the pitch, we regard that as the gut, where food is digested into small food components. So it can cross the halfway line into the bloodstream. And from there, we use those foods in order to grow and to maintain all the cells in our body, but also to repair muscle after exercise, to improve our mood, to fight bacteria and viruses, and for our heart to stay healthy. So Orla's gonna talk about this, the gut, and particularly the lower gut. And Maria is gonna talk about these health outcomes and how food affect these health outcomes. But what I would really like to focus on is this halfway line. This is the gut barrier. And the gut barrier is really the small intestine. It's where digested food crosses the gut into the bloodstream. And the small intestine is six meters in length, but it has a surface area of up to 250 meters squared, which is about the size of a tennis court, um, a little bit smaller than a soccer pitch. And the reason why it has a surface area of 250 meters squared is because it has these villa-like projections, and these are worm-like projections. So the inside of your small intestine looks like this, millions and millions of these villi, which are these worm-like projections. And so food has to pass through the gut out into the bloodstream. And it does that by passing a single layer of cells called the gut barrier. And this is paper, paper thin, but each cell holds onto its other by a its neighbor by a tight junction. So it's paper thin, but it's the gatekeeper deciding what foods are gonna come through the gut into the bloodstream. So what do I do? Well, the first thing that I do is I digest food in the lab. We have models of the stomach and we have models of the small intestine, but we also grow this gut barrier. And it starts off as single cells here, and we grow them in specialized compartments called transwell plates. And over 21 days, they, make, they mature into a tight junction gut barrier. And we know it's a tight junction because we can run an electrical current through it and measure resistance. So that's, that's really exciting to be able to grow human cells outside the body. But it is tricky. And what adds a layer of complexity to it is adding this food digester to it. So what I do is I lead a, a group of scientists worldwide trying to get these conditions just right. So once the 21 days are up, we take the food digester and we put it on these gut barrier for two to four hours. And we look, do any of these food components, do they help that gut barrier? And then what comes through to the other side? 
Now we grow muscle cells in the lab, nerve cells in the lab, uh, immune cells in the lab. So then we ask the question, with these food components, do any of them help repair damage in those cells or maybe protect those cells against disease or maybe help those cells function? And if any of these food components do that, we call, the, we call them biologically active or bioactive. And that's food bioactives. So now I'm going to give you three examples of how we've used this work. So the first example is with infant milk formula. So in this case, we manufactured the infant milk formula in the factory by two different ways, one by the traditional high temperature route and the other one by an alternative processing called cascade membrane filtration. This is a low temperature processing. So remember the two infant formulas we made had the exact same ingredients. And then we take them and we model the infant gut. So we take that food and we digest it as if it was an infant gut. So an infant gut has a higher stomach pH, it has shorter time, food has shorter time in the, in the stomach, and it has lower enzyme activity than an adult digestion. And then we grew our gut barriers. They were matured for 21 days. And then we took these two infant formulas that have been digested and we looked at the benefits they have to the gut barrier. So here we're looking at electrical resistance and we find the one with the lowest heat actually increases the electrical resistance of that tight junction. So it's improving how the cells connect with each other. And if we go and drill down a little bit further, we can see that some of the markers of that holding hands with each other, this in this case, Claudin 1, is also increased. So therefore, lower heat, lower processing, lower temperature during processing helps those tight junctions. So it's a win-win. Another example I'm uh, going to uh, describe to you is uh, casein hydrolysis. So in this case here, we're looking at milk protein and milk protein is divided into two families, casein and whey. And so what we did there is we took the, the casein proteins and the whey proteins and we chopped them up into what we call hydrolysis. And we made 765 unique hydrolysis. In parallel, we grew these specialized cells in the lab called endoendocrine cells. And these endoendocrine cells produce satiety hormone. Now, satiety hormone makes us all feel full after a meal, and it decides how much food we're going to eat at the next meal. So we took these 765 hydrolysis and we incubated it them with these cells, and we measured satiety hormone production. And in this case here, it's GLP-1. And so the first hydrolysis here is in, level, is in yellow, and it has a very low amount of GLP-1. But then this hydrolysis increases the amount of GLP-1 produced from these cells. So this is a casein hydrolysis. So it's increasing the amount of satiety hormone produced by these cells in the lab. So then we asked ourselves, if it's making those cells feel fuller, would it make a mouse feel fuller and reduce the amount of food it eats? So in this case here, we give the casein hydrolysis to the mice. And then over an eight hour period, we measure the amount of food that that mouse eats, its own food, how much of its own food does it eat? So the blue indicates the animals that got the casein hydrolysis. And you can see that they clearly eat less than the green control animals. So if we give it to humans, what happens? Well, in this case, we used a small sample size, but again, we saw that if you give the casein hydrolysis to the humans, you find that their levels of satiety hormone, GLP-1, increases in their blood. So now we have a casein hydrolysis that makes you feel fuller for longer. So we may be able to use this to control how much we eat at the next meal and therefore help us manage our weight. So the final example is whey protein isolate. So athletes use whey protein isolate all of the time to repair muscle after exercise. And they do that because whey protein isolate is easily digestible and it delivers essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids to muscle. But what we wanted to know was, were there other peptides or stretches of protein in whey protein isolate that could also benefit muscle cells? So again, we did an in vitro adult digestion. We grew our gut barrier for 21 days. We added our whey protein hydrolysis digest, our whey protein isolate digester up on top. And we collected the peptides that come through the gut barrier. 
Now, very excitingly, in the last few months, we have learned in our lab how to age muscle cells. So these are adult muscle cells here, and now we have aged them in our, in our lab. So this is an aged muscle cell in red. And we add all these whey protein isolate peptides, and we discovered that five of the six we tested actually reverse that aging process. So maybe whey protein isolate should be used by the older consumer to help them run up that and down that stairs in their 80s. So hopefully what I've explained now is what is food bioactives? Do they cross the gut barrier? How do they work in cells? Can we protect them during food manufacture? And obviously we want to enrich them in our foods. So why is that important to you? Well, it's important to you to have a healthy diet which is rich in bioactives because it means that your soccer ball is inflated, that your soccer pitch is pristine, that the gut is functioning very, very well. You can see, clearly see the halfway line with its tight junctions. And of course, you have a very good blood system, which is delivering all these healthy bioactives to your um, skin. It's helping improve your mood. It's improving your energy levels. It's helping you fight infections like bacterial infections or viral infections. And ultimately, it allows us all to live healthier for longer. So of course, athletes have been using food bioactives to improve their performance for years. They don't necessarily have to understand the mechanisms of how bioactives work on cells, but they do know that they work. So Dervla O'Rourke um, says she got into cooking to specifically improve her times, not her exercise regime, her diet. And if you look at Rebecca Brunson, for, uh, who's a US basketball player, she talks about limiting carbs and balancing her proteins to balance her energy over the day. And Emma Coburn, who's a steeplechase world champion, she talks specifically about glycogen and muscle 30 to 60 minutes after workout and to replace it by using bananas and smoothies. And if you look at Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor, um, talks about taking a uh, muscle mass level muscle mass index levels every day and from that deciding how much carbohydrates he's going to eat and what type of carbohydrates he's going to eat and of course athletes don't just want to perform well they also want to extend their life as a professional athlete so they all want to be this guy kazoo kazoo is 53 years of age He's still a professional soccer player for Yokohama FC. He's a striker and he's had a long standing buy in to the importance of bioactives in the food that he eats. But not all of us are athletes. We just all want to be maybe like Eileen Noble. She is 85 years of age and she just ran her 20th marathon this year, even in a pandemic. So what is the alternative for you if you eat a bad diet? which is full of sugar and bad, high saturated fatty acids. So what you start off with is a deflated soccer ball. Your soccer pitch, your gut is sluggish and waterlogged and boggy. You cannot clearly see the halfway line. So the tight junction is leaky and it's allow allowing these bad bioactives into the bloodstream where it's causing acne in, on our skin. It's making us feel tired and fatigued, prone to illnesses like bacterial infections or viral infections. And long term, a high sugar will attack the pancreas and cause type 2 diabetes. And saturated fatty acids will clog the heart. They will also cause fat cells to expand and cause the um, overweight and obesity. So what I would like to remind you is that we dig our graves with our spoon. And although exercise is very important for all of the muscles in our body, and particularly for our heart, you can't outrun a bad diet. And Orla will talk to you more about that and the importance of the gut and the diet with exercise. So hopefully now I've gone through all of these things and I've talked to you about food bioactives, what they are, um, how we measure that they cross the gut barrier, how do they work in cells, can we protect them during food manufacture, and can we enrich them in foods. So thank you very much for your attention. So I'd like to continue the conversation about food bioactives now and discuss a little about the different sources and applications of these key health ingredients. 
the whole concept of food bioactives, it's not a novel concept. In fact, um, the Greek philosopher Hippocrates first mentioned that food can be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Um, and indeed, uh, other philosophers followed up with um, disease such as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, such as Benjamin Franklin. Now, so food bioactives have a number of different sources. And luckily for us, um, they're found in, in nice foods such as yogurts and cheddar cheese and other fermented foods such as kefir, fermented meats and fish. And within the, this source of uh, food bioactives, the bioactive agent is known as the bioactive peptide. And Linda mentioned a little about these earlier. So what are bioactive peptides? Well, they're sequences of amino acids or the building blocks of protein that are between two and 30 in length and they're cut from parent proteins using uh, good bacteria such as lactic acid bacteria uh, during processes such as fermentation, or they can be generated also with proteolytic enzymes or high pressure. And they have health benefits. For example, they can help to inhibit um, bad bacteria and they can have health benefits for your heart in addition. Other sources of food bioactives include fruits and vegetables. And a, a big bioactive uh, that are sourced uh, you know, largely from fruit and vegetables are phenolics. And you may be familiar with products such as Benicol, um, which were the actives that are known to lower um, cholesterol are actually phenolic in nature. So phenolics are derived from fruits and vegetables can actually inhibit diseases such as, or they can inhibit enzymes important in the development of diseases such as type two diabetes. And they can also help to um, prevent inflammation. So how do they go, how, what is the mechanism of action or how do they actually inhibit and prevent these diseases? Um, so I'm going to discuss now an example which relates to heart health. And the system that relates to heart health and blood pressure regulation in the human body is known as renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this is a key system to control salt water balance and um, blood pressure. So within a normal, normal tensive situation, um, everything is fine, but as soon as blood pressure decreases slightly, um, the kidneys release an enzyme known as renin. And this, this enzyme renin acts on angiotensinogen, which is um, a hormone produced by the liver, and it, it is converted into angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1 is a vasodilator, or it, it helps to maintain um, the bore size of your blood vessels and keeps them dilated. So in this situation, blood pressure is normal. However, angiotensin 1 is then converted to a vasoconstrictor or something that constricts your blood vessels by an enzyme that's reduced, released from the lungs and kidneys known as angiotensin converting enzyme 1 or ACE1. And the effect of this action really is um, an increase in high blood pressure or hypertension. It can also cause thirst and, and other things as shown here. But the main activity that we're trying to inhibit is this high blood pressure. So in order for a food bioactive derived from a fermented meat product or a phenolic from fruits and vegetables, for, in order for them to act on and help prevent high blood pressure, um, they can target the ACE or the renin enzyme. So if you can basically inhibit the ACE enzyme or the renin enzyme, you can help to maintain vasodilation of your blood vessels and to prevent hypertension. A second target I'd like to discuss is um, the COX uh, enzyme or cyclooxygenase enzymes, okay? So these are a key target in terms of um, inflammation and pain. Um, now here I show the cell membrane of a, of a cell, okay? And within this cell, you have a polyunsaturated fatty acid known as arachidonic acid, okay? So this, uh, this polyunsaturated fatty acid can be converted to pro-inflammatory or agents that cause inflammation, um, prostaglandins, okay? By enzymes known as cyclooxygenase enzymes or COX enzymes, okay? So if a food bioactive can inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, they can help to um, prevent the production of these uh, pro-inflammatory agents known as prostaglandins, and they can help reduce pro-inflammatory markers such as IL-12, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. And indeed, COX enzymes are actually the target for commercial drugs such as aspirin and ibuprofen. Okay, and, and when you take an aspirin or an ibuprofen, 
uh, the actors in that inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzymes, and that is what gives you the anti-pain and anti-inflammatory effect. So food bioactives, um, it, when present in the correct concentrations um, and with the good bioactivities, can actually also inhibit these um, enzyme targets. The third target I'd like to discuss now is um, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. And this enzyme is very important in the development of type 2 diabetes. So we can see here in this diagram that um, your hormones such as GLP-1 and GIP-1, which are, which are hormones active um, in the regulation of blood glucose levels, and they had to lower blood glucose levels in your body, um, they are converted, these hormones are converted by the enzyme DPP-4 um, into inactive forms, okay? And this can cause um, elevation of blood glucose levels. So again, if our food bioactive can target this enzyme, DPP-4, it can help to prevent type 2 diabetes. So some examples I'd like to discuss. Um, I'll start with one from phenolics, okay, related to phenolics and phenolics from rapeseed byproducts specifically. So this lovely yellow plant we see here is rapeseed and it grows very well in Ireland and we use it largely for rapeseed oil production. But a byproduct of rapeseed oil production is rapeseed meal. Now, this byproduct has a, it's high in protein and it can be used as an animal feed, but it's also rich in anti-nutritional phenolics known as sinapinic acid, okay? Uh, and this sinapinic acid is what we've worked on here um, in Chugs Ashton um, in relation to de its development as a heart health ingredient. And this work was carried out by Leah, who's pictured here uh, in conjunction with Trinity College Dublin and St. James's Hospital. So um, in terms of how we went about extracting this active, uh, we first of all got rapeseed um, meal uh, from an Irish supplier. We then stabilized it using freeze drying technology and then using a number of different solvents, we extracted a sinapinic acid rich extract. We then dried it using rotary evaporation and we enriched the extract for sinapinic acid using chromatography methods. We then did a number of bioassays, which I'll discuss next, and we purified it using technologies such as reverse phase, um, HPLC or um, liquid chromatography. And we also used mass spectrometry to characterize the active. So once we had our extract, we wanted to assess how good it would be as a potential ingredient um, to prevent hypertension. And in order to assess this, we carried out the ACE inhibition assay. Now, in vitro and in my lab, this assay is carried out using a plate reader. It's a colorimetric assay, which means that um, a simple color change can indicate whether something is an active or an inactive. So here, for example, in this 96 well plate, you can see that, um, that there's yellow and clear colored wells, okay? Now, the clear colored wells contain bioactives that are, that are ACE inhibitory and the yellow wells um, demonstrate that there's no activity present in the, the extracts tested here. Captopril, uh, which is a commercial drug um, known to reduce blood pressure, and it, it's consumed uh, regularly by a lot of people in Ireland and elsewhere, um, was used as a positive control. And as you can see here in these wells, um, all wells are clear, and this is where Captopril was present which can also see that there's a decrease in the intensity of the yellow color in other wells where we have um, an inhibition of ACE1. And these wells contain our sinapinic acid extract. So where you have a clear color, it indicates ACE1 inhibition. So the results that we achieved here uh, uh, in this assay are shown here. And as you can see, when assayed at physiologically relevant concentrations, um, our sinapinic acid containing extracts um, reduced and inhibited ACE1 inhibition uh, and can therefore are their precursors for trials in, in, in vivo work to determine an antihypertensive effect. A second biopsy I'd like to discuss relates to anti-inflammatory activity and we also assess the anti-inflammatory activity of our SA containing extract and to do this we grew cells known as THP1 cells or human cells in a similar manner to what Linda described earlier. So we grew our cells here on this, this insert. And once they were grown, 
Uh, we then applied our cinnapinic acid extract uh, to, the, to the cells and we assessed whether there was an increase or a decrease in pro-inflammatory markers. So the markers for inflammation, I've mentioned them already, they include things like IL-12, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. So here we can see in, the, in these graphs that our extracts containing cinnapinic acid, again, at physiologically relevant concentrations, um, managed to re, um, inhibit the pro-inflammatory um, marker T, TNF-alpha. A second example I'd like to discuss is uh, peptides derived from byproducts of um, muscle harvesting. Okay, so the blue muscle, mycelis edulis. And um, in this work, which was carried out by a postdoc uh, within my lab, as Anaya, who's pictured here, we developed an ingredient with potential to inhibit um, enzymes important um, in the development of type 2 diabetes. So ordinarily, this byproduct muscle um, it's used for things like fertilizers, it's used in pet ingredients, and in the past it was also used uh, as buttons because the shell is quite hard, so it made a suitable um, substrate for button manufacture. Um, it can also be used um, for surgical glue, um, which is quite a novel application. But we, we were focused on the, the meat fraction of the muscle, okay? Um, so the meat fraction of muscle makes up about 30% of the weight of the muscle, okay? Um, and in order to recover it effectively, we used hydrolysis technology. So hydrolysis basically is the application of different proteolytic enzymes or enzymes that can chop up protein um, to a substrate um, and controlling the conditions such as pH, temperature and um, revolution or rotation. So hydrolysis te hydrolysis technology is very useful for the generation of bioactive peptides. But in addition, it can also help to reduce potential allergenicity of proteins. And it, it's, you know, it's a method that's used in the manufacture of uh, protein powders or hydrolysis that are used today in sports nutrition, in foods for the elderly and in infant nutrition. So this is kind of a, a, a picture representation of, of the steps that we carried out. So we got our byproduct muscle, we carried out a hydrolysis process using a proteolytic enzyme, and we then had a shell fraction and the hydrolysis fraction. So the shell fraction is rich in cal calcium, and um, we, did, we also implemented a method where we convert this to calcium oxide. And calcium oxide has different applications um, in the oil industry, for example. But our main focus was on the proteinaceous hydrolysis fraction. This was stabilized using freeze drying again, and then we carried out a series of um, chromatography steps to isolate bioactive peptides. So we, we generated this hydrolysis powder. And then we assessed using another um, bioassay, but this time a fluorometric bioassay, the potential of this, um, the potential of this muscle powder to inhibit enzymes such as DPP4 that are important in the development of type 2 diabetes. And the, the fluorescence method again was carried out using a plate reader. And we used a positive control, um, this drug, which is actually used to um, prevent uh, di type 2 diabetes. And as you can see from this graph, several of our, our blue muscle hydrolysis fractions managed to actually inhibit the DP4 enzyme. Now, this isn't only good news for your health, but it's also good news for, for um, muscle harvesters and muscle processors because Every year, there is a huge volume of byproduct muscle produced in Ireland, and in order to um, fulfil current um, reformed com fisheries uh, targets, this this is one approach that could be used. Okay, so we can actually convert this byproduct, which is normally considered a waste, into a functional product and add value to this um, whole industry. Now, the third example I'd like to discuss is seaweed, okay? And seaweeds as a source of both protein and bioactives. So in Ireland, we're very blessed. We have a, a very clean coastline and um, we actually have over 400 different species of, of seaweed uh, along our Irish coastline. And these are either grown through aquaculture or harvested. And there's a number of companies currently harvesting seaweeds uh, for their potential food and feed applications. So examples of seaweeds include the brown seaweeds, such as Ascophyllum nodosum or Notodrac, and you, you might be familiar with that from your days in secondary school. Um, 
Other examples include things like Albicia caniculata, and then you have green seaweeds such as Ulva intestinalis. And seaweeds in general are um, generally recognized as safe. Uh, and indeed about eight seaweeds are actually consumed as sea vegetables currently in Europe. And they're a sustainable species, so they're worth looking at. And in terms of protein content, they contain um, up to 47% protein on a dry weight basis. Now that's species dependent and seasonal dependent dependency comes into account also. But when you compare that to dairy, it's significantly higher. However, it can be quite difficult to access the bioactives in, in seaweeds, uh, including protein. So um, a focus of our work is really development of novel technologies to access these. Now, I'd like to talk about one other bioactive, which is linked to protein. It's a, it's a, a small peptide called glycine betaine, and it has a, a close relative known as GMSP. And we, we previously developed methods to extract um, this bioactive from uh, two different seaweed species, um, namely Ulva intestinalis and Codium fragile. Okay, so glycine betaine, it's, um, it binds water, so it can be used in baking, for example, to keep confectionery um, moist and to retain water. Um, but it also has an important role to play in control of high blood pressure. It, it can influence cooling in, in the body. And indeed, uh, there is actually an EFSA approved claim um, for choline um, derived from different sources. So this again has great commercial potential, we believe. Other bioactive peptides that we've isolated um, include uh, peptides with renin inhibitor activity, which we found from the red seaweed Palmaria palmata. And this work was carried out by Kieran Fitzgerald previously. So Kieran has published a number of papers on this. So if you're interested in these, please contact me but they basically are all targeted at the renin enzyme, which again plays a significant role in the control of blood pressure. We went a step further with this research. We actually formulated um, the hydrolysis containing um, peptide mix into a bread product, and we trialed it in consumer trials also. And we found that in general, the bread was well received by consumers in terms of its appearance, flavor, texture, and its overall general acceptability. We also um, carried out an in vivo study where we assessed the antihypertensive effect of this developed ingredient in an animal model. And the model we used here was the spontaneously hypertensive rat. So we use controls also in this study. So we use the, the drug capturable, which is ordinarily used to control high blood pressure. And we tested our, both our peptide, our peptide containing hydrolysis and the bread made with the peptide containing hydrolysis. And as you can see from this graph here, um, systolic blood pressure was greatly reduced in a 24 hour period uh, by both the, by the hydrolysis, the peptide and the peptide hydrolysis containing bread. So thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you found this an interesting talk. And if you have any further questions or if you want to read up further on it, uh, please refer to these papers. Or if you just want to drop me an email, my contact details are on the slide here. So thank you for your attention. As Linda explained earlier, the importance of whey protein and bioactives in an athlete's gut. And now I'm going to discuss how these impact our gut microbiome and how this is important for uh, the health of athletes and us non-athletes in the general population. Those of you who tuned in last week to the, the first research webinar will have heard about the microbiome from Kira. But just to reiterate, our microbes live and reside in and on every surface of the human body. And this is composed of bacteria, archaea, fungi, phage, and viruses. The majority of these microbes reside in the GI tract or in our uh, gastrointestinal tract. And why are we so interested in these microbes? The microbes in our gut play a pivotal role in human health. They are responsible for harvesting energy from our food, for digesting our food. They play a role in initial immune response. They produce hormones. And recently we've discovered that they play a role in satiety and also in mood regulation. And how do we study them? In each, one of our, in each of our guts is a unique cohort of these microbes. 
and there's potentially a thousand different types of species at any one time. Historically, this would have involved going into a lab, getting a plate of agar and growing the microbes in, on the plate. Now, each microbe will require a distinct recipe in order to grow. So they'll need a distinct um, set of ingredients like a certain amount of glucose, a different type of agar. And also, if you imagine if they're living in our guts, they're not exposed to oxygen in the air. So if we try to grow them in a normal lab, then it's very difficult because as soon as they are exposed to oxygen, then they tend to die off. So we need to treat them anaerobically, which is much harder to do in the lab. So the scenario that you're dealing with is that in order to profile the microbes in a gut, you would need a thousand different agar plates just to see the species. So what was happening is we were ending up with an iceberg effect. So what we were only able to grow was the tip of the iceberg. So we were able to culture or grow in the lab about 30% of the microbes that are present in your gut. And this left us with a huge unknown of about 70% that we didn't know what they were or how they were growing. And in recent years, we've moved to more modern technology called next generation sequencing. And how this works is you extract DNA from a fecal sample, and then you sequence it on a next generation machine, which we are lucky to have multiple machines in Moorpark or in Chagas. And what this does is it gives you the computer code for the DNA present in the, micro, in the gut microbes in your gut. And using bioinformatics or computational tricks, we can then regenerate the profile of the microbes that are in any environment, not only our gut, at any one time. So we don't need the thousand agar plates, we can do it in one single sequencing run and get a profile of up to 100 people at any one time. We can then, so it's much faster and more streamlined. So this is a question that comes up nearly every time we give a talk is what is a healthy microbiome? And the truth is we don't actually know. So by that I mean we don't know what specific microbes you need present in order to be healthy. What we do know is that diversity is key. And what I mean by that is the more different types of microbes you have in your gut, the healthier your gut is. So each microbe will have a certain set of functions that it performs. The more different types of microbes you have, the more functions that your gut can perform and the healthier it will be. So if we take um, a box of crayons, if you only have one color in the box of crayons, your pictures are all going to be red and they're going to be very boring and they can only perform one function. But if you have a box of crayons that has a hundred different colors in it, then you can paint pictures that have multiple different colors. They're much easier to understand and they get the message across better. Similarly, what we want is high diversity or a Sahara desert. So multiple different types of species all working together to make you healthier. What we don't want is a low diversity scenario, such as this colony of penguins, which is a single species all living in the same environment. The key driver to diversity in our gut is diet. The more diverse your diet is, the more diverse your microbes are. So if we take that in another way, if we only eat one type of food, even if it's a healthy food, so say if you only eat apples, all you'll have in your gut is the microbes that are required to break down that apple. So while you might think that, oh, apples are healthy, I'm doing the right thing, your gut isn't healthy because the diversity has dropped off. And in fact, there's only one time in your life when low diversity in your gut is desirable. And that is when you were born. So if you're born, the ideal way to be born or the healthiest way to be born is a vaginal birth and breastfed with no antibiotics. And those babies will have low diversity. So only very few species present in their guts. And this is what's deemed healthy for that stage of your life. And as I said, I just said there, your microbes are assembled or seeded as you're born and the type of delivery that you have and how you are fed will form the initial microbes in your gut. As you move through childhood into adolescence and middle age, your microbes become relatively stable. And then as you enter elderly age, your microbes start to become unstable again and diversity will start to drop off. 
But what we do know is that almost every aspect of modern lifestyle can alter your microbes, whether for the, the benefit or the detriment. So if you take a course of antibiotics, this will detrimentally affect your, your gut microbes. A probiotic or a prebiotic will benefit your microbes. And what we have seen in recent times is that fitness can also modulate your microbes for the better. So why are we interested in looking at fitness and the microbiome or uh, exercise and the microbiome? Well, exercise is quite similar to diet in that it affects almost every system of your body. Exercise is anti-inflammatory. It regulates your mood. It alters gut transit time. It can produce hormones. And it's intrinsically linked with, the, with diet. So what we've noticed is that people who go on an exercise plan will do form into two groups. You have those that go on an exercise plan and say, okay, I'm being healthy. My diet will now become extremely healthy in concert. Or you have another uh, cohort, which will, will be of the mindset that I've just done two hours in the gym. So now I can go and eat a big greasy McDonald's or I can have a Mars bar. And so what we're very interested in doing is see, can we, tease apart the individual effect of exercise or fitness at, on the microbiome and can we then look at the individual effects of diet or will they always be intrinsically linked so our research into fitness and exercise and the diet and gut microbiome started in 2011 when we were invited to attend the irish pre-world cup training camp up in uh, minute the fact that it was a pre-World Cup training camp meant that there was a larger squad number. So there was 48 rugby players in one place um, for a prolonged period of time. So what we did is we took fecal samples to, in order to get their microbiome profile and their metabolites that these uh, microbes produce. We took DEXA scans so we could measure their body mass. We looked at their fitness levels and we also had multiple biochemical um, data, so how um, the levels of glucose in their blood, how much um, their blood pressure, a lot of health parameters. And what we did is we compared them to two different control types. The reason we took two different control types is that if you look at the nature of a rugby team, you have the backs, which are lean, would have low BMI and are built for fitness and speed, whereas the pack of a rugby team are built for strength, they wouldn't be as lean. And in fact, most of them would be considered to be clinically obese based on their BMIs. So we had a high BMI and a low BMI control group in order to remove BMI as a confounder from this study. And what we discovered was that athletes have more diversity in their gut microbiomes compared to controls. And this was at the composition, so what microbes were there, how these microbes were functioning and the metabolites that they were producing. And when we looked to see what was driving this diversity, we noticed that the diversity was associated with the levels of protein in your diet. So the higher the protein in your diet, the higher the diversity of your microbes and also your fitness levels. So the fitter you were, then the more diverse the microbes were. And at the moment, this isn't a causative effect. All we've noticed is a statistical correlation. And when we went back and looked at the diets of the athletes, what we noticed is that, that they were taking high volumes of whey protein in their diets. And when we looked into how these microbes were functioning and what the, the microbiome of the athletes were performing, what the microbes were doing is they were primed for muscle repair, so recovery post-exercise, for degrading the protein in the diet, and also for recovering vitamins quickly from your diet that they were eating. So what we wanted to do then was to see, could we train a regular Joe's microbes to become more athletic? And what we did is we did an exercise intervention study where we took self-proclaimed couch potatoes. So what we mean by that is that they hadn't done training in six months previous to the study. They all had high BMIs. We separated them into three groups, an exercise group, an ex a group which took exercise along with a whey protein supplement and a whey protein only group who were told not to change their exercise habits. And the exercise was carried out in the Maridike gym in UCC, 
but it was a similar expenditure to if you were going to, to, to undertake the couch to 5k and what we did is we took the same samples that we had taken for the rugby study and we looked at them pre and post intervention and what we saw was no change in the microbiome at the compositional level, the functional level, or the metabolomic level. And what we concluded from this was that it wasn't the exercise that mattered, it was fitness. So going on short spurts of exercise had no effect at all and could not make your gut healthier. The important thing was to be fit. So the fitter you were, the more diverse your microbes were. And to further investigate this, we wanted to see was, even in people who are considered fit, could we see a separation of your microbiome based on the levels of fitness? So what we took was, um, it was a running club in Cork who are extremely fit and train as much as an elite athlete. They would be training for marathons, for ultra marathons, for half marathons. They'd train, as I said, they are as fit as an elite athlete, but they just wouldn't be professional. So their training loads would be considered the same. And in order to measure fitness, we use this measure called VO2 max. And what we saw that indeed comparing the VO2 max with the fitness levels and training load, so the amount that somebody was training during the week, we could indeed see a separation of the microbiome based on fitness, even in already very fit individuals. So fitness does matter to your microbiome. And what was driving or separating the um, the groups on VO2 max. So what we saw is multiple species that reside in your gut microbes. And of particular interest to us were these ones. So acromantia is a, a microbe that degrades the mucin layer on your gut wall. And it has, in the last few years, come to the fore as a biomarker for health. So it's been associated with leanness. So the more micro, uh, the more leaner you are, the higher the levels of acromancy in your system. And when we looked at our rugby study, we saw that the rugby group and the lean BMI group or the low BMI group had higher levels of acromancy compared to the high BMI group. And this is um, of interest as a novel probiotic or a next generation probiotic um, in the future. We were interested in this Vianella because there was a study that came out of Harvard last year that looked at marathon, so elite athletes post running a marathon. And what they saw is there was an increase in not this particular species of Vianella, but a different one. And this increased immediately post marathon. And when they looked at how it was functioning, it was breaking down the lactate produced by the muscles into propionate and basically helping the athletes recover quickly. There was four strains of Prevotella that were increased in this study uh, that were distinguishing the fitness levels in the study. And what we know is that Prevotella has been shown to be increased in elite cyclists. And what Prevotella does is it degrades fiber and also it utilizes the glucose that's in your diet. So what we're postulating is that Prevotella is there to harvest quick energy from your diet, which would be very efficient for an athlete. And as I said before, the eight week intervention study, we didn't see a change in microbial diversity. And it's very hard to get a large cohort of people to adhere to an intervention past eight weeks. But we were still interested in seeing if we went past eight weeks, could we see a change in diversity? So for this, we took an N of one approach, but we had two participants. So we had Two, again, self-proclaimed couch potatoes, no exercise experience in the previous six months and had high BMIs to begin with. One was training to, to do a marathon and the other was training to do an, an Olympic distance triathlon. And over the course of six months, we took all the same measures that we had taken for our previous studies. We collected fecal samples, urine samples, blood samples. We did DEXA scans and measured their fitness using VO2 max at multiple time points across the six months. And as expected, their body composition improved in that they lost weight, their lean body mass increased, their BMIs improved, and also they got fitter. So their VO2 max improved and also their blood pressure uh, metrics improved. This is exactly what you'd expect. But because we had taken multiple microbiome time points, 
what we were able to do is observe real-time changes to microbial diversity. And if you look at these two panels here, the black bar across the middle is the average microbial diversity of each individual. When there's a blue, it means there's a gain in microbial diversity, and the pink means there's a reduction in microbial diversity. And what we could see is when each participant was at peak diversity, we saw, sorry, when each individual was at peak fitness was when their microbial diversity was at its best. So fitness did matter. The fitter they were, the more diverse their microbes were. And when there was a break from training or when there was illness, we saw a drop off in diversity. So as researchers, this was fascinating to us that we could indeed map changes in microbial diversity based on real-time events. And also interesting to us, when we looked at the metabolites that these microbes were producing, as the both individuals got fitter, the metabolites associated with leanness and fitness increased as, they, as the time went on. So what we are now trying to do is to harvest or mine for novel probiotics from the athlete gut. So over the course of all our studies, we've amassed a fecal biobank from the athletes. And what we are now trying to do is develop an athlete from athletes for athletes. So these would be tailored to the specific needs of an athlete, but also would then be able to translate to the general public. So what we would be looking at is a probiotic that would prevent against infection, would help energy metabolism, prevent oxidative stress, maintain gut health, all of which are very important to, to an athlete, but also to the general population. So I hope I've showed you that fitness is important to the health of your gut. And what I didn't say today is that different types of sports will have different, subtle different impacts on your gut microbes. Also, if you're traveling or not, that will have an impact on your gut microbes. The fitness, your fitness levels alters your gut microbial profile and also how often you train. And what knock-on effect this has is that it alters the diversity of your microbes, it changes the metabolites that are produced and also the species that are present in your gut microbes. And thank you for your attention and I will take any questions. Um, question for Linda. Uh, what was the control in the casein hydrolysis and satiety study? Okay, so thank you, Maren. That's a very good question. So in the cells, the control was the casein itself with 11 millimolar glucose. In the mouse trial, we did several mouse trials. We did pig trials, but I think the one I represented there, the mouse trial was an IP injection. So the vehicle control was fine. And in the human trial, it was a small sample set and we introduced the casein hydrolysis by a nasojejunal tube into the duodenum. And in that case, there's no control, it either works or it doesn't work. And um, it was very little calorific value. I think it was only 15 grams of hydrolysis. So that's, uh, that's with that data that I showed you there. Okay, and a second one for you, Linda. Um, is there always a correlation between in vitro and in vivo tests which are performed to establish the functionality of food bioactives? Okay, another very good question, and it's something we grapple with all the time as scientists. So um, the in vitro stuff, um, it, the in vitro assays are all kind of a funnel. So it's a, a very good starting point. But then it has to make it through maybe animal trials and eventually it has to be effective in humans. And so really it all depends on the efficacy or how the dose that you need. So I would say that it completely depends on the food bioactive, but the in vitro work is your starting point. Okay, thanks Linda. Um, next up is a question for Maria. What technology can be used for targeted delivery to the heart of phenolics, uh, phenolics extract from rapeseed? Okay, so that's a very good and difficult question to answer, um, Maren. Um, we're looking at reducing high blood pressure. So the target isn't necessarily the heart. And what I didn't mention in my presentation was that the ren angiotensile-aldosterone system is located in different locations in your body. So you actually have a ren angiotensile-aldosterone system in your gut. And that is the reason that 
after a heavy meal, <laughs> all the blood goes to your gut <laughs> uh, and it's linked to your renin and your tensile aldosterone system. So uh, the idea with our phenolic extract is that we would include it in different foods. So we would formulate it at active doses in different foods and then assess whether it's bioavailable and if it can reach that target in the gut. And that in turn would help to control blood pressure. Okay, and next question for you, Maria, is which is the best method for extraction of protein or bioactives from seaweeds with maximum yields? Okay, so that again is another very difficult question to answer, but I'll do my best. Um, we are, we've currently got a number of projects in this area here in Chagask. Um, methods that, that we have tried include things like applying high pressure um, to burst the cell wall and release the protein within. We've also tried hydrolysis methods, um, fermentation methods, and the application of novel technologies like um, microwave assisted extraction um, and others. But uh, to my mind to date, the best results have been achieved using um, hydrolysis with uh, both proteolytic and carbolytic enzymes and they're enzymes that break both carbohydrates and proteins down. Um, you will affect the composition of the protein and the structure of the protein. So it will change its functional um, attributes. But on the plus side, as I discussed in the hydrolysis technology section of my talk, um, you know, you can reduce potential allergenicity and you also create bioactive peptides which have health benefits. So in my, in, in my opinion, I, I think hydrolysis is a good method to use. Okay, thanks Maria. Thanks so um, next question is for Orla. How can the average Jill or Joe increase their microbiome diversity? Um, yeah, as I said in the talk, the key driver to microbial diversity is diet. So the more diversity you have in your diet, the better. Um, and also then if you add in fitness, but as Linda mentioned in her talk, you can't out-train a bad diet. So the key to microbial diversity is, is really diversity in your diet. And at the same time, not just diversity, but diversity of whole foods and non-processed foods. Okay, and kind of a follow-on question from that then is, when you, when you talk about out training a bad diet, for people who don't have regular exercise, can they take more pro probiotics or prebiotics to improve the diversity of their microbes? Yeah, I suppose any level of exercise is important really in that it, it's not only affecting your gut microbiome, but like exercise will also improve your mood, it releases endorphins, and it also has an anti-inflammatory effect on, on your whole body. But if for whatever reason you can't exercise, then being diverse in your diet is really important. And not only probiotics, but a prebiotic coming from a fermented food like kefir or kombucha will, will help drive microbial diversity and maintain gut health. Okay, um, so thanks for that. Thanks to our three panelists uh, for their great presentations. Thanks to everyone who joined us and for sending in your questions. Our next webinar in this series will be on the 18th of November and is titled The Demands on Our Land and it will feature Min Minister for State Pippa Hackett. I hope you'll join us again. Thank you for joining us today. And again, thank you to our panelists.